<laughs> we haven't commented on it yet, but if we don't comment on it, there will be comments about it. <laughs> what do we got? I know when this car came out, there were some issues with uh, people waiting a long time to receive their car. Audrain Museum Network. Today you don't join us in Newport, Rhode Island. We've actually traveled all the way to New London, Connecticut, which is actually not as far as I thought it would be from the museum. But we're very lucky today because we are driving the Lotus Emira. And what makes me happy is it's a new sports car with a stick. And I'm joined by my friend Bear Dalton from Lotus of New London, who's going to be talking with us a little bit about Lotus and the Emira. And Bear, thank you so much for this opportunity today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, a lot of times on the ABS podcast, Ben, Sean, and I fall victim of talking about the P word, which we call Porsche. And we always say, let's see how long we can make it through a podcast without talking about Porsche. <laughs> and immediately after a 10 minute drive with this car, I'm having a really hard time with trying to not get a cave in or something like that, you know, I do have a, a boxer and I love my boxer, but this gearbox and the hydraulic steering that you get in this car is absolutely amazing. Yeah, the notchiness of that shifter is just phenomenal, right? Yeah, the shifter feeling is, is amazing. And special thanks to Lotus of New London for making this video possible. So my experience with Lotus is not as much as it would be with some other brands. I have driven many Porsches, but the last time I drove a Lotus, I did drive the Lotus Evora 400 GT. And immediately looking around this car, the first couple things that I notice are the fit and finish of the Emira, which is better rather than the, uh, than the Evora. And even something like an Elise, it looks like a totally different car with the same badge on it. Gotta love that supercharger wine. Yeah, we have a V6 from Toyota that's supercharged. We're making about 400 horsepower. So there's two different engines in this car, right? There's the this engine, the V6 supercharged, and there's also a, a four-cylinder from Mercedes, correct? Yep, the M139, which they originally were gonna release with 360 horsepower uh, so that it didn't step on the toes of the V6. Uh, now, now they're releasing it with the 400 and 356 pound-feet of torque. It's a whole half second faster than the V6 stick. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. And that comes with an eight-speed dual clutch. Eight-speed dual, and this also comes with an automatic. This has an automatic available as well. Uh, this comes with the fluid torque converter uh, automatic that it traditionally did in the Evora GT. They felt that it, it retained that linear feeling of acceleration that you get with this motor paired with that Edelbrock supercharger. And not for nothing, it is still very aggressive in sport mode as an automatic. So one thing that I absolutely love about this car so far is the hydraulic steering. It's kind of a gripe if you drive a, a modern Porsche, they've gone away with their hydraulic steering and we always talk about you know why why would they do that why would they go away from it I mean the the feeling and the sensation you get through the steering wheel obviously this is a mid-engine car so your handling is going to be pretty good anyway but when manufacturers go away from that that's it's always frustrating for me and this just feels so good. The AMG four-cylinder was gonna have electronic power steering. Okay. Um, and they decided to uh, to go away from it. To retain some of that, that purest feel to yeah. the vehicle. Absolutely. That makes Lotus a Lotus. That love of the drive, that smile that it puts on your face every time, you know? You either know Lotus. It, Lotus is a brand that tailors to car enthusiasts, especially with, with a car like this. And I feel like 
most non-car people would see this, and they would be like, oh, that's a, um, that's a Ferrari, or that's some sort of Lamborghini or something. I mean, the styling of this car is, is very, very aggressive, and I think it's a little bit more um, in your face than, than the Evora, which this replaces. But it's also subtle enough that it's, if it wasn't in this yellow color that it has, it would probably blend in uh, a little bit more. But I feel like as a brand, they're, I mean, I'm looking at fit and finish and, and everything else. Overall, it's beautiful in here. There, it, it doesn't seem outdated. And I feel like the reliability and, and some of those issues that you might have heard of in the past have kind of gone away in, in a car like this. Yeah, the, the reliability factor, the finicky factor has definitely uh, gone away a lot from the Evora GT over to the Amira. Um, it's it's definitely you can tell that it's not just hand assembled by one guy which can be great in some respects mm -hmm. but as you know from the fit and finish of the Evora GT there's something to be said about a full line manufacturing process and not just one guy building one car at a time by hand I mean I think the direct competitor of this would be the Cayman GTS I have driven a, a Cayman GTS. I, I can't notice any difference between the fit and finish from the Porsche and this. And that's I'm, saying something. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, maybe a couple things, maybe uh, some of the dashboard trim, but I feel like, I don't know, that's probably an option that you can buy on the Lotus. I know you can on the Porsche. I, I mean, you correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, you, can, you can spec out the interior the way you want it to. Uh, for the most part, yeah. The, um, the first editions were pretty standard with the packaging. Yep. It's a fully loaded variant. You can control certain aesthetic things like the color, the black pack, the interior, and that's about it. Everything else is standard. The base was going to be subsectioned out to convenience pack, a driver pack, so on, a technology pack, so on and so forth. But even the base, they decided from all the feedback from the customers, things like having a backup camera, Yep. Everybody needs that these days. Yep. So convenience pack became standard. Also came standard with the 12-way power seats instead of the four-way because people want that extra bit of luxury in this car. It's, it's gone away from the purest and strictly enthusiast to a much broader audience of exotic car people. That makes sense. I mean, it has power in spades too. But now, now imagine someone who's buying a Porsche to hop into this and it had no power seats like the Avaris. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you have to have that. And I think what one of Lotus's trademarks are, uh, they don't have a, a, a ton of power. A lot of times they're loaded. Lotus is famous for being lightweight and this is a, a pretty lightweight car, but it is also heavier, heavier than the Evora, but I will take that extra weight for the comfort. I mean, there's who, who's to say that you couldn't get in this and, and drive across the, the country. I mean, this is a very, very comfortable car. While the touring suspension isn't quite as stiff, I mean, 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually feels pretty dramatically different. My, the thing I love about the touring suspension over the sport is the road compliance with New England roads. When, so when you say touring suspension, is that a package that you can buy for this car? So you can get, uh, you're clear on the right. You can get it with either the touring suspension, uh, which is a little bit 5% softer, or the sport, which is more tuned to like the racetrack, what the Evora GT had. Um, the touring, you get all of that feedback from the road, but when you're driving on the New England roads that have divots in the side and are yep. torn up, it's not taking over the wheel and bringing you all into yeah. those little grooves and stuff. It's you, not tram lining like it would with you know a car with like negative camber or something like that. That's yeah. more set up for track use. And you can feel that it's there, but it's not taking away from your ability to control the car to the best of its ability. No, you know? not at all. Whereas in this, if you're getting a little bit too uh, carried away and you're going around those corners and there's divots, those are gonna suck you in a little bit. And yep. they're gonna take away from your ability with the car. But as you can tell, I'm a little bit biased myself. <laughs> <laughs> Although the Sport, I have grown to love because I've been driven this thing almost 2,000 miles at this wow. point. But um, 
I still a little bit biased towards that tour. I mean, yeah, even on a road like this, you you can feel that. I mean, I have the handling is is totally fine, but the suspension is is sucking up the bumps because this is a pretty bumpy road that we're on. Yeah. And the gearbox is fantastic. I mean, I haven't done a ton of miles, but incredibly easy to use. I know some of the I wouldn't call them complaints, but some of the comments from some of the other road testers are that the pedal box is a little challenging to use. I can see how, you know, you would think that. Um, I'm gifted by the fact that I'm five foot seven and have size eight and a half shoe. So I'm able to use full advantage of the pedal box. I think that's where the Porsche probably has this beat because the pedals are a little bit wider and the pedal box is more in the center. I'm a little bit more off to the right side here. It's not as aggressive as something like a 1980s Ferrari 308 where my feet are in the passenger seat over there. <laughs> but uh, really, really good pedal box for, for me. Hey, and I'm six foot, 225 pounds, and I think it's it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's probably one of those things where you have to get used to. And also, as I'm driving this, I like that this car is a little bit of a challenge. Like I'm, I'm really thinking about shifting gears. I'm thinking about where I'm placing the car. I mean, we go back to the hydraulic steering. I am feeling everything through the steering wheel and it, and it adds to the driving experience. Yeah. A lot of newer cars are kind of numb. Even if they have a stick, they're numb. You get in and it's after, you know, 10, 15 minutes, they're not, they're not a challenge to drive anymore because you get used to them. Whereas this, it still feels like a little bit of a challenge for me to drive it and actually makes it more enjoyable in my opinion. I love how right out of the box, you can tell when you hit the gear because Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very satisfying. So right now we've been driving the car in sport mode, we'll do tour mode. So you said in tour mode, the throttle response is 20% less. 20% less throttle response. 20% less opening from the get-go, and you also get 20% less opening at the 34 and 4300 RPM yeah. sequences. You can hear that the that the car is quieter, for sure. Yeah, when you're going through little neighborhoods and stuff, I usually switch it over to touring. You're about to pass a cop, switch it over to touring. Yep. Once, once you're back cruising again, having fun, back to sport, and then when I'm on the highway, and I'm just cruising in six gear, I'll throw it back in touring again. Fuel economy will continually go up. Like right now it yeah, says wow. we have 70 left. If you were to just drive it normally in touring back to Newport, you'd probably still have 70 left because of wow. how much you'd be gaining. That's impressive. When I took it up to Newport, I got 33.4 miles to the gallon. Wow, <laughs> wow. Obviously, as car enthusiasts, we want to hear the engine and we want to go through the gears and have all those sensations, but that does have a time and a place. Yep. And you know, if, if you and I, you know, even if we were took this to New York and we just wanted to have a casual conversation, I mean, exactly. what, a, what a difference it made in just putting it in sixth gear. But I am, I do have major ADD, so I will put it back into sport mode and make noises. <laughs> Even in sport mode, though, you can carry a conversation. Yeah. It's not like hopping in a Lamborghini Gallardo and then all of a sudden you and I can see each other's mouths moving, but that's it, you know? Yeah. And it's pretty fast. It shifts very nicely. I feel like this is a really good price point in the market too. You know, we I'm looking at the news this week. It's October 20, on the right. 23rd today. And Porsche just came out with the new GT3 and something like a you know forty or fifty thousand uh, dollar increase in price. And obviously the GT3 sits above this in the marketplace in terms of horsepower and prestige and all that blah 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 but i feel like the obtainable sports car is becoming more and more difficult 
for the enthusiast to achieve. Yeah. And something like this, yeah, it is $100,000, but that is still, in my opinion, an achievable number for someone who works hard and is saving up to have their dream car, which could be the, the Lotus uh, Amira. I like that it's kind of positioned that in that price range and in, in the market. And we, we don't do any markup on MSRP. It's not going to be like picking up a GT3 RS for 250 over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. And I'll tell you, we've shipped cars all over the country because I, I do it a little differently. I do it honest, transparent, straightforward. Yeah. I don't do any markups. If anything comes in that, uh, you know, a flaw in the paint or something, I inform the customer, get Lotus to take care of it. That's awesome. You know? Yeah, that's nice to hear. It's not like, you know, you're, uh, in order to get the next uh, whatever it is, you have to have the customer give you a, a Rolex or something. So Although they, that would be appreciated. That, that would, that would, <laughs> I, I would like that. So I know that we haven't commented on it yet, but if we don't comment on it, there will be comments about it. <laughs> what do we got? I know when this car came out, there were some issues with uh, people waiting a long time to receive their car. I feel like now I'm starting to see more of these on the road. Could you could you talk a little bit about why uh, it took a while for these to, to get on the market? So initially, um, when they were going to release the Amira, they assumed because they're using the same power plant as the Evora GT, that they would be able to clear federal and carb emissions. Um, unfortunately, because they're a smaller brand, they don't have anyone to lobby for them like larger brands like Volvo, Mercedes do mm -hmm. when they come out with new models. Um, they are just put on a waiting list by CARB for the CARB certification, uh, which is emissions for California. And um, they're on the waiting list for quite a long time, just waiting for it to go through. And uh, finally, once they got that, they were able to start producing for the states and start shipping them out. Um, and then, of course, once they started shipping, we did have the whole uh, Baltimore port go down and stuff, which added Ooh, some more yeah. time on there and oh, whatnot. Man. Now, in terms of color options, how many different colors are available for, for this car? It's 13 colors available, uh, as well as several interior options, which uh, this one here is the red Napa leather. There's also a tan Napa leather, which is almost like that basketball-y type leather. Uh, and then there's the ice gray Napa, which is almost white, but not okay. quite. Okay. And then you've got the Alcantara, which has leather inserts on it available with a gray stitch, red stitch, or yellow stitch. And on the bases, CAF Audio is not standard. You can get CAF Audio as an upgrade. It does have a high fidelity nine speaker system on the base. Um, CAF is a 1500 watt system. It's very crisp and clear. Yeah, I would have a, that sounds great, but I would have difficulty listening to the radio or my music in this car because all I would want to do is just go up and down the gears all day long. Yeah. Just listen to the engine. I'll tell you, when I drove it to and from Newport for the uh, for the Adrian Motor Week, um, I brought my wife up with me because we were hitting multiple parts of the event, multiple days. And um, about an hour into it, she's like, we don't have the radio on. It's it like, I know. And she's like, and I didn't even notice until right now. It was by design. <laughs> oh, that's funny. that resonation and yeah. stuff and just gets you all excited you know <laughs> oh yeah i have to say watching videos of this car i wasn't fully convinced of the sound but now that i'm actually driving it and experiencing it it does sound much much better in person it sounds really really good and i feel you, you hear that supercharger whine and i feel like the that's hard to convey on camera yeah The tone has a really nice tone to it. I'll tell you what, you know what we should do next? When we get the turbo in, we should do this again. I would love to do that. And then do a side-by-side -side too. Yeah, that would be great, <laughs> that would be great.
I'm a millennial. I'm on the Gen Z millennial cusp at 27. But as the kids say, I know I'm quote unquote cooked because <laughs> the enjoyable or the, the enjoyment of driving this car is so high and we're ending the video now, but I know I don't want it to end because I just want to keep driving it. And I know that the product is good when I'm finding excuses to keep, keep the video going or it's like, oh, let's go do this. Oh, let's go do that. <laughs> so it is, I, I'm sure you could tell from my smile that I, I am very much enjoying this car and, and really, really do like it very much. One more question for you. How does the driving experience of something like this compare to the all electric? I personally would have a hard time going from something as fun as this to something like the, the Avaya. I mean, maybe that the driving experience of that is, is super good. Um, I don't know. So I haven't driven the Avaya myself. I can imagine that 2,000 horsepower is um, enthusing or... So the, the Avaya, okay, the Avaya is the, is the hypercar. What's the SUV? Is that Evita? The, the Electra. Electra, okay, I'm sorry. I got my names wrong. So we actually did the unveiling of the Electra uh, at Lotus New London last November, uh, just before the CT International Auto Show. Uh, we had the R, which is 905 horse. And um, I'm a little bit biased against electric. I like combustion engine stuff. I like the feel, all that. Um, but I hopped in that car. The, te the technological advances that Lotus brought into it, like the auto tinting side, side windows and roof, um, the fact that the Lotus uh, infotainment system knows where each passenger is and each passenger could do controls to it and be like, hey, Lotus, roll down my window. And they're in the, the passenger side rear seat and it just yeah. goes and does it for them. You know? Um, the drive itself, I mean, 0 to 60 in 2.9. It's an <laughs> absolute rocket. Yeah. But completely controlled. It you When you, you step on it, you feel that it's going sideways a little bit. We did videos. You can see that it starts to let loose a little bit, but then it grabs and... Um, it's, it's actually, I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed by the time we were done with it. Yeah, I feel like that would be pretty challenging for a company like Lotus who's based their reputation on making lightweight, nimble sports cars to, to go to an all-electric uh, SUV. But I hope they, they figure it out. And it, you know, I would be sad to see this, this power plant go. Um, but we'll, you know, it'd be interesting to see where, where they actually take it and if they do actually go fully, fully electric. But to go back to my original kind of question at the beginning, you know, would I, would I take this over a Porsche? I think I probably would after driving it. I mean, I love Porsche and it's something that we always talk about on our, on our podcast, but the overall enjoyment and the, the fit and finish and the sound and, um, the way it makes me feel, I feel like that's very difficult to, to convey over camera and to, it's one of those things where you actually have to be in it and experience it to really kind of get the, the magic of it. And I, I really like this car a lot. Yeah, it's gonna, almost like it creates an emotional connection to you. I know, I know. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Just, just not good for your pocket. <laughs> not good for your pocket. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was You're fun. You're welcome.